Welcome to Myanmar Museums, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's the 22nd of the 2nd in the year 2020, and today we are discussing tea shops in Yangon with Dinit Adhikari, PhD candidate at the Department of Anthropology, School of Culture, History and Languages at the Australian National University. Hi, Din. Hey, Luke. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So, we are both Australians who grew up going to what we call restaurants and cafes. In Australia and in so many countries in the wider uh, Western world, there are um, very few things known as tea shops. So what is a Yangon tea shop and what drew you to study them? Mm. <clears throat> That's a great question. I think first and foremost, the definition of a tea shop is very flexible. And the broadest baseline is that it has to serve tea. Aside from that, it can basically be anything. And I've heard a lot of different definitions about what a tea shop is, but the one that I like the most um, is that a tea shop spatially is very accessible, sort of like a cafe, um, so that people can just walk in by the street, see, a, see the tea shop, it's an open space, they can come in and sit down. And uh, inter- interestingly, uh, one person described it to me as a lifestyle so that you can you know, sit down for a long time, there's no real urgency to go and eat a meal quickly or finish anything quickly, which differentiates it from, say, a restaurant, but sort of puts it in the same-ish category as a coffee house. I think it's easy to say that uh, tea shops are quite a special and a unique part of um, Yangon and Mandalay culture in particular. Uh, if you are not uh, born in Myanmar and you come to Myanmar, you notice them. They're uh, everywhere and they have sort of a distinct place in the local milieu. So I want to drill down a little bit more into what makes a tea shop a tea shop. How does a tea shop fit into the other kinds of places that people can go? So if you get up in the morning and you're going to meet somebody somewhere, what would make you go to a tea shop and not to a restaurant and not to a, a beer shop? And Yeah, so I think it all comes down to that, that idea of accessibility. For example, a restaurant would have a certain price point that you'd have to spend. Um, it has its own kind of connotations of how the space itself kind of behaves. So, I don't know, for example, you get like a Italian restaurant that serves Italian food. In that sense, it kind of limits who the customers who kind of go into that space because they have to make a choice to make that, to decide to eat that food, kind of food. Whereas a tea shop, because it serves a diverse range of, it enables more people to come. And I think that's like an important distinction. So like the base, the base price of a cup of tea is reasonably cheap. Anyone can more or less afford it. And therefore that accessibility thing means that it allows more socializing and um, allows people to have more choice of what they consume. So that it's all, it's all to do the, with the accessibility of the space itself and not necessarily the product that they consume but more like you're buying yeah you're buying your access to the space and because the entry point is quite low it does facilitate a lot more a lot more access tea shops are private space as opposed to public space but people might use tea shops more like it's public space than private space something like that people people hang out um, whereas they wouldn't hang out in a restaurant. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a. I think that's a good point. I think the key thing is that when you go into a tea shop, you getting like a membership to the space, and you, once you have your cup of tea, you can spend as much time as you want in the space. Whereas a place like a restaurant, you have to. There's a finite amount of time before you sort of spatially kind of overstage your welcome, and you need to be turned over. Whereas a tea shop, you can. You buy a cup of tea, you can just sit there for hours doing whatever you need to do. Originally, tea shops were a focal point. People kind of went there to socialize, to get news, to arrange businesses. It was, it served a very big social purpose. You, if you wanted to find out what was going on, you could go to the tea shop and you could hear about the latest developments in the news. You could, um, 
you know, if you needed something done, if you needed some kind of business to be done, you can go there. there you, you know, there's always all these stories of like car brokers being in tea shops trying to sell you cars. And, you know, the handyman for your streets got his office in the tea shop. Or even you know, I've heard examples of uh, a person, a professional passport applier, has his office in a tea shop so that people can kind of come and get these sorts of services. But And they still exist, but probably less so now at the moment I think there's uh, the introduction of like mobile technologies has kind of created this like converg convergence of so like physical space and digital space so you see a lot more people when they're in the tea shops using their phones using using the internet using different mobile technologies so you get a lot of people probably pursuing leisure activities so you see a lot of people playing video games on their phones and that's a really big thing in tea shops now and yeah so and kind of just sitting on their phones a lot more so those kinds of original functionalities that maybe present the foundations of a tea shop they are sort of being changed to more of a space where people can maybe i wouldn't necessarily say it's leisure but it's something akin to that where people kind of use time in a different way where they can just kind of either take a break out of their day to just use their phone or um, yeah, or maybe to kill time. So it's something that I'm looking into, but the, there is a shift from what the tea shops, the foundations of what a tea shop sort of, the tea shop space sort of enabled to how it's kind of being used now. And I guess the point that I've been harping on about is like accessibility in space. But we have to also think about tea shops as a space interrelating with other spaces around it. And that also really defines what a tea shop does, what it what kind of social functions it has, what kind of stories and histories it has. So, for example, um, one tea shop I go to, which is sort of on the edge of downtown, doesn't have necessarily the same kinds of social spaces around it that would enable constant foot traffic. So it's actually um, quite close to the Baptist uh, church institutions, uh, I think Judson College, um, near a bus station, and that's it. And so it's actually become a bit of a meeting spot for taxi drivers, Baptist ministers, and a few people from from us. Oh, and there's a there is also a government office. So its entire customer base, the way it functions as a place, is really related to what happens around it. So you don't see some of the things like what I've been saying earlier: people kind of sitting down and playing on their phones. It's not a social hangout spot but it's a place for taxi drivers to take a break and to kind of have a have a chat with the owners who they usually who it seems that a lot of taxi drivers know quite well know the owners quite well or it's a place for the the Baptist ministers to kind of come and have like a, a working lunch and so I think that's the other most important thing about tea shop spaces because space is always constantly changing and if we look at tea shops macroscopic, uh, macroscopically as Yangon's social space is changing, the tea shops themselves are changing themselves because the relationships that really sort of support them, support what the tea shop is, are changing around them. So we kind of talk about, for example, rent and the growth of the larger tea shops. That's, that's like an example of broader spatial changes which are affecting the business of the smaller tea shops itself and also changing customers and we see um, you know for example the fact that there's in a shopping mall which is a huge thing uh, with centralized shops that changes who comes to the tea shop that's set up in in that shopping mall so it's it's always important to think about the space itself, but also to think about the spaces that are uh, influencing. And I think it's actually one of the things I'm kind of discovering is the more I think about what are the other social spaces, it informs me far more about what the actual story of the tea shop space itself is. And what about the political situation in Myanmar, the political climate and the history of political change here? I often hear um, Burmese people talk about 
what tea shops were used for and how they were used during the darker times when people had uh, less uh, freedoms mm. and there was a stricter control of information. So has that made a difference? I think so. I think there's a lot of um, narratives that the tea shop plays in political, um, in politics. And, you know, there's always the story that the 88 kind of democracy movement so kind of came out of a fight in a tea shop but you know, I'm not sure uh, I think it would be taken with a grain of particularly because of the amount of um, social control that was ever so that you know there's always stories of people kind of being listeners in the tea shop but I, I think that it was always a place for news to be I mean they were used as a place for news to be discovered and discussed so I mean, politics would be something that would come up in, I imagine, those conversations. And a lot of people have told me stories of you know, the. Uh, I remember this, uh, an older guy, older man, telling me kind of wistfully of the golden age of tea shops, where people would go and just discuss things, and you know, you'd have um, late night street side tea shops where people would sit down and they would discuss everything. And politics would surely be one of the topics of discussion. So I think it's it sort of is part of the fabric. I'm not sure how much the idea of this space is as a political, political mobilizer, but the fact that it can enable those sorts of discussions means I'm not really surprised that that's happening. But I think like in these days, as much as the, these kind of discussions happen, and I mean, a lot of, some people say that tea shops are dying, dying and you know, sometimes you'd see probably t-shirts which had, would have its predominant customer base being um, seniors that would probably still use those spaces to discuss but those kinds of uh, discussion spaces have moved to online online now and you can see it on like Facebook is is the uh, kind of news medium for in Myanmar and it allows people to kind of actively discuss already um, so I think that kind of functionality and the convenience of accessing that digital space does take away from discussing the uh, politics from the actual physical space itself. So it's still there. For people who haven't traveled to Myanmar, um, they may not be familiar with the way that people order and drink tea. So we're in a tea shop right now. We want to order a tea. How do we get a tea? Well, you basically just order the specific kind of tea. So, for example, oh, I got chazain na nakwen. So, basically, what I just said was chazain, which is uh, dark and yeah, so it's dark and creamy, and basically it's strong black tea, evaporated milk, a little bit of condensed milk. So you can specify the the levels of the condensed milk, the evaporated milk, and the black tea in your in your cup and it goes from this absolute sweetest to the uh, the most bitter and strongest tea you, you can get this is also an interesting thing um, so for the most part people either order either get waiters attentions by making a pocket kiss sound like the which is a it's, it's, I've heard it's a little bit derogatory, but it kind of cuts through the noise of the t-shirt quite well. Or the same way that you get the attention of a dog. So it's not necessarily probably the, the nicest connotations when you get attention to a waiter. But, I mean, it does cut through the noise of a t-shirt very well. So if you ever need to get a waiter's attention. And the fact that the way the space works is that you're buying into the space and then you can do whatever you want when you need to settle the bill and the waiters are busy either doing other things themselves, you need to, you need to get their attention. So it's either the pucked, that pucked, uh kiss sound, or I've heard um, the, you can either do sh, the sh sound, which also cuts through. So yeah, those are the two main ways of getting into attention. So I guess that's one way of thinking about social relations and what Hill has kind of touched on this in his research that you should see social relations through the prism of hierarchy and the way that old, old to young um, status to high status to low status, male to female, those, and they're kind of shaped in the space itself. So these kinds of 
there are sort of interactions that sort of come out of it. And I mean, I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with what War Kill is saying, um, but you know, there are probably elements of that that you know, most of the tea shop work is are uh, young young boys. It's um, so there's always like an ageism there, and maybe like hierarchy is played, yeah, in these kinds of interactions. So how does a tea shop work, practically speaking? What are people paid? Uh, how do people uh, work there? You know, you often see interesting things, like there's often a, a very proud sort of owner kind of person on a pedestal, you know, dealing out the cash. Like, what? how does a tea shop practically work from the business side? Right. So, at the base level, you've got your workers. So, these are generally the boys from villages, there's sometimes, and boys and girls from villages. They're usually young, young children, probably maybe up to their teenage years. Um, so they kind of work the floor and they move between different tables and take orders and they um, kind of get the order and then they take it, they kind of yell it out to the, the kitchen space where you'd have people who would be making the food, so the various kinds of salads, or if it's a morning time, they'll have the either fried rice or mahinga, like a big like vat of mahinga ready to go. Some tea shops have a dedicated tea maker, a uh, pure sale, who will you know, make the tea and it's kind of a ritual in itself where they pull the tea and it's very, it's very flamboyant and it looks really great. I think with the current kind of adaptation of tea shops, the pure sale role can kind of go to anyone since you can just, you can make a just as good cup of tea if you um, spoon like a teaspoon of like condensed milk and a bit of evaporated milk. So. A pure sire is sort of around, but maybe their kind of roles are a bit more have been absorbed by other workers in the tea shop uh, in the tea shop kitchen. And then at the very top of it all, you have your your manager, and this is usually the guy who kind of sits behind the counter and he's always just uh, either distributing the cash that uh, the tea shop workers need to give back to change, or they're just kind of accounting for what's happening in the tea shop and. You know, directing workers to either go attract different people, uh, go attract, um, go sorry, attend to other customers, or kind of make sure that the tea shop's running as smoothly as possible. And the tea shop manager serves like a pretty important role in that certain tea shops have, you know, they have a vibe, and you know, some, the manager sort of helps shape the vibe. And you know, people who are more very flamboyant managers who kind of talk with all the customers, and I think that kind of social interaction. People do pride, pride, like do enjoy. So it is. They play an important role in kind of making the tea shop space what it is. Big, far, huge tea shops would have, you know, intermediaries. So you'd even have like little hierarchical hierarchies amongst the workers. Like as in, someone would walk around with change of with money to distribute change when people have finished their meal and are ready to pay up. So it's all the business structure. It's flexible, but. Uh, that's the basic kind of structure of work is the kitchen staff, the manager. Coming to this tea shop from downtown, I passed at least a dozen other tea shops. There are thousands of these places across the country. Was it always so? When did tea shops become a thing? And what is their uh, sort of trend curve? Are they on the increase or are they on the decrease? Mm. Well, my hypothesis is that the tea shop is a spin-off of the British Tea House. I mean, if we're talking about Yangon specifically, um, the fact that Yangon was in, in its early colonial history a city for its uh, Indian populations, these kinds of tea cultures that were that existed in India, combined with tea houses, sort of started being established in Yangon itself. So, but. How that's sort of manifested into its own unique space now, that's something that is, you know, there's not too much, uh, not too much source or materials that I've uncovered, which is something I really want to, want to know, especially like how we've gotten to this point of having the unique tea flavors, the open space, the sort of social functionalities of the space itself. Um, but come to your the second half of your question about what tea shops are doing like are they thriving today 
it's also a bit of a it depends on it depends on who you ask some people say tea shops are dying so in that younger people kind of are choosing to go to uh, cafes or other places like that um, you have it's definitely the smaller tea shops seem to be struggling quite a bit in the current um, urban development of Yangon so we have small tea shops which you know we probably relied on those original social functionalities that I'd mentioned earlier that so those since those are disappearing and the fact that they're facing more increased rental prices or um, increased um, food supply prices they're kind of getting priced at but also they're getting they're competing against probably a new development with t-shirts which I would call which I've heard is called Sanji which is big shop and basically these these newer tea shops that are emerging which are huge spaces serve tea but also serve more than the general usual amount of s snacks or small leaves so you'll have more substantial substantial meals so it's sort of like a restaurant without any of the accessibility restrictions and those are becoming more and more popular and because of the far greater options available people are kind of moving to these bigger spaces to use yeah, to do what we said, what I said earlier, that people kind of choose a teacher for the space that it kind of provides, then a space that has multiple usages is means that it's more attractive for people to go to. So that business turnover to the larger sign G's means that the smaller tea shops themselves are struggling. And you hear people saying um, how even if they're selling cheaper tea, they can't get the customers to kind of come because they don't they can't provide the same sort of same sort of options that other the larger teachers can offer. So and it depends where you ask. And there's also like a uh, I'd say a, also like a class element as well attached to it. So there, you see uh, for example Shui Falin, which is one of the big tea shop chains well in Myanmar, they exist um, predominantly in shopping malls and that's sort of tapping into the, the kind of middle class markets. Um, I mean, it still has the same accessibility, you know, the prices of a Shui Pulin are pretty, quite reasonable, but at the same time, who's in a shopping mall and if they're going into a tea shop there to have to eat meals, it, there's, it only caters to a certain kind of customer base. So while they kind of have the, almost a monopoly on this sort of space, it means that the, they kind of expand on thriving, but then on the probably on the ground, on the streets, where you have multiple different kinds of tea shops competing for probably the same kinds of customers, that it always ends up that the smaller ones are losing out, which is unfortunately a sad thing. So in this lovely, green and pleasant tea shop that we are recording this interview in, there are lots of mixed groups. It's probably 50% men, 50% women. But some of my female friends do not like going to tea shops because they don't feel comfortable going to tea shops. What's that all about? And um, you mentioned masculine spaces. Um, can you talk more about this complicated notion of uh, gender and tea shops? Yeah. So I would say that tea shops are predominantly masculine spaces. And I think, you know, if you sit at a tea shop all day, there's a clear shift in the ratio of men to women in a tea shop. For example, in the mornings you'll have, it'll be fairly equal, probably still mainly men, and you'll have people eating breakfast together and then you know going off to do their whatever tasks that they need. And in the morning times, when people are eating meals, the average time they would spend is reasonably short. But and then you'd kind of notice something interesting that maybe around 9 a.m., the dynamics start to change. So as the tea shop sort of empties, you, the people who actually end up coming to the tea shop or staying in the tea shop will be met. And throughout the day, those spaces will become more and more um, predominantly occupied by men. And, I mean, that's not to say that women don't go to the tea shops. I mean, there are, there are plenty of... Um, 
women who do visit tea shops during the day. But I think there is like a gendered element in how people use the tea shop. And it's very rare to see women stay in the tea shop if they're not working in the tea shop to stay in the tea shop for a long period of time. Whereas you do see um, men spending upwards of two, three, even more hours in the tea shop. And I think there's a, a lot of reasons to kind of explain this. And I, it kind of depends on how, like, which, like, which avenue you, you kind of choose to choose to think about. There's like the Buddhist paradigms that um, Ward Keeler sort of touches upon. There's hierarchies, and then these kind of manifest in all these different ways of, you know, cos- like cosmologically in Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, that men are, are superior because they've attained a rebirth which is higher than a, a woman's rebirth, or and that kind of manifests itself out into um, social spaces, and therefore that kind of enables the so sort of freedoms and privileges and I mean I think it's probably like a combination of all these things but I think kind of think going back to that idea of the functions of a tea shop the original functions of a tea shop and what the foundations of people of the tea shop being a, a place of where you can get different services and those services seem to be more male dominated services and then now that that's shifted I think there's still some the gendered elements of that still remain where male men can still go to these spaces but without necessarily the actual economic relationship. I think like, you know, if you think about gender relations, like, you know, thinking about the way gendered labor works, the way markets work and the gender dynamics of that, there seems to be clear gendered spaces which uh, seem to either be occupied by women or occupied by men and all of those kind of manifest themselves in where people kind of occupy themselves and as a result of that it seems the tea shop is predominantly a male occupied space and tea drinking and it, and it kind of sort of facilitates um, things that would could be described as performances of masculinity such as drinking tea, chewing beetle, smoking cigarettes. Every, most tea shops will have ashtrays and cigarettes or will have a, a gunya, the beetle stall nearby so and those things are seem to be associated a lot more as masculine activities and they because they kind of situate themselves around the tea shop it sort of seems to enable more men to occupy these places. So it seems to be that's one of the reasons that make these tea shops like a cycle that enables enables men to kind of occupy these spaces a lot more easily than women. I think there's always worth in studying the everyday uh, everyday space that is frequently used, and I think there's a lot of tensions and lots of um, different kind of intertwined systems all working with each other. So tea shops a great place to kind of think about economic relationships, gender relationships, political issues such as race, um, all of those things manifest in the t-shirt. So it's top down, it's, it provides a snapshot. You can, if you go to a t-shirt and you spend enough time and you can, you can witness all these things playing out. So it's a, it's a great place to start. But more so, it's also just a unique, um, unique place it space and you know, always thinking about the accessibility this thing that anyone can sort of go to means that you're always going to witness a lot of different things happening in a day and I think people really really cherish that and they really have stories of how tea shops have played a big part in their daily routines or their childhood lives or what they do today so these kinds of stories if we if we kind of are studying Myanmar societies then this is and this space means it's a great thing to to research and look into and so last tea shops just is something that's a common common element in a lot of people's social lives and to kind of research those social lives, so you can just focus on the tea shop and get a lot of a lot of fascinating information out of it. Okay, our final question on Myanmar musings. 
every episode is always asking for a recommendation. Um, it can be anything to do with Myanmar. But since you're a tea shop expert, I have a feeling that your recommendation might be related to that. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so I think one of the main things I would recommend is going to the smaller tea shops. Um, so, you know, as Yangon changes and people kind of talk about tea shops changing or disappearing in itself entirely, you know, it's great to go and spend an hour just drinking tea in a, in a dark room and just witnessing all these things. So smaller tea shops, not, uh, you know, you can always go to big chains like Lucky Seven or Shwepling and they'll always be around, but I think the smaller tea shops are, are always worth a visit. So I definitely recommend, especially in the downtown area where there's so many tea shops that are still still there that you should definitely go um, you, you'll just find them everywhere and I think the other thing is uh, I'd actually recommend a radio drama that I absolutely love It's and I think a lot of viewers have probably listened to it but if you haven't The Tea Shop Diaries which is uh, basically a radio drama about a tea shop and they explore a lot of stuff related to Myanmar it's really great listening um, so I mean, they, it starts from when they set up their new tea shop and keeps going from that. I think they're already up their, they're already up their sixth season now, so it's, a really, it's really worth a listen. Thank you so much for coming on Young Man Musings, Dean. Thanks, thanks, Luke. It was, yeah, it was really good. Thank you. <laughs>